Amleth, the Viking Hamlet. If you ask most people what they think about uh, the character of Hamlet, they'll probably describe uh, an indecisive and almost cowardly figure who's unable to take revenge on his uncle for murdering his father. Most people are, of course, familiar with Shakespeare's Hamlet, a product of Elizabethan England, and, and Shakespeare's character was a very complicated and nuanced character that uh, explored some of the you know, subtleties of human psychology. But the character didn't originate with Shakespeare, and it didn't originate in Elizabethan England. It's attested in texts that come from the uh, Middle Ages in uh, Denmark, maybe not surprising if you've heard Hamlet referred to as the Dane. Uh, the, the character and the story is not only set in Denmark, but it actually originated in Denmark. Uh, and the medieval world that this uh, character comes from looks like this. Uh, there's the regions of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, which roughly correspond to the modern nation states, although they're not exactly the same because these nation states don't exist yet. Uh, Gotland or Geatland, which is associated both with Beowulf, is where Beowulf is from, but also uh, mentioned in the saga of Rolf Kraki, which you may have already read. Uh, I've separated Britain and Scotland because these are described as different countries in the, the text. And Iceland up there in the top left, uh, a source of a lot of the Old Norse texts that we have because the Icelanders, despite being a really small population, produced a lot of literature from the Middle Ages. But this text about uh, Amleth actually comes from Denmark. It's one of the, the few texts that actually doesn't come from Iceland from this time period. It comes from Denmark and it comes from an author named Saxo Grammaticus. Uh, that is Saxo the Grammarian. And his larger work is called Justa Danorum, or History of the Danes. It was written around the year 1208. He began production of it in, in 1208. And as the, the title in Latin suggests, this is a work that's in Latin. Although Saxo is Danish, uh, he could speak you know, the, an old Scandinavian, an old Norse uh, type of language. Everyone in the Middle Ages in Europe who wanted to write for an international audience, wanted to write in the language of scholarship of, of the church, but also of the academy, would write in Latin. Although this was not the language of the people of this area, obviously. Only a handful of scholars could read this. And the region he's describing, this is, again, the modern nation of Denmark, but it's not a nation state at this point. It's a series of kingdoms with the most prominent kingdom being located at Lera. That's on that island of Zealand in the middle of the uh, this enlarged map. Zealand is where the uh, Hrothgar's Hall of Hailrot in Beowulf is located. It's where Hlidar, the Hall of Rolf Kraki in the Saga of Rolf Kraki is located. So the king who rules from the central area of Lera on Zealand tends to be the most powerful sea king in Scandinavia. And frequently the other kings, like the kings of the Jutes and Angles and Geats and Swedes, tend to be subordinate to this king, although there's never uh, really the kind of hierarchy that we would see in the Roman Empire or that we might see later in the age of European empires. Uh, this is going to be important in the text about Amleth because uh, Amleth's father and uncle rule over the Jutes, they rule over Jutland, but they're subordinate to King Rorik in uh, Zealand. Now, unlike most of the authors we've read so far in this class, uh, Saxo is writing a chronicle. He's not setting out to write a work of literature. He's not setting out to write a unified narrative with uh, coherent characters and you know something like an epic that has a, something holding all of the individual events or episodes together. He's writing a chronicle, and for our purposes, a chronicle is a record of historical events arranged in chronological order uh, in a list form. Uh, with you know, sort of here's a year and here's what happened that year and here's the next year and here's uh, what happened in that year, rather than a, a unified narrative. And a good example of uh, an extreme version of a chronicle is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is written over uh, several centuries in the early Middle Ages. It'll have lots of different authors and they'll write something like, you know, uh, in 860, uh, this is the year that King Ethelbald died and his body lies at Sherborne. And then 861, uh, St. Swithin uh, died, who was a bishop. And then in 866, importantly, uh, this is when the great heathen army attacks England. And I chose this segment of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in order to highlight this event. This is where uh, this group called the great heathen army, which is led by, as you see down in the, the 870 entry, led by two guys named Ingvar and Uba. This is uh, Uba and Ivar the Boneless that are sons of Ragnar Lodbrok. 
this allows us to see that uh, the Anglo-Saxon England and the uh, Scandinavian Norse were very closely connected uh, throughout this time period. This is going to be relevant to our, our narrative about Amleth. But a chronicle is usually just like this. And this year this happened, this year this happened. There may be something uh, connecting several of these years, but from beginning to end, there's no consistent narrative. Uh, the completely different characters come and go, and uh, there's no beginning, middle, and end. It's just one thing after another. But Saxo's not just trying to write a list like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. He is trying to make this into a story. And he admits that he's taking these different sources uh, from all over the place, including oral tradition. He even mentions that he's using runic inscriptions. He says, you know, not only did the, the Danes allude to the splendor of their nobly wrought achievements with choice compositions of poetical nature, in other words, these poems that praised rulers and things like that, but, but they also engraved the letters of their own language on rocks and stones to retell these feats of their ancestors, which have been made popular in the songs of their mother tongue. And these are the sources that Saxo admits that he's pulling together and uh, taking individual narratives and putting them into this larger chronicle. And the, But still, the one thing that unifies the whole chronicle is that it's a historical record of Denmark, which did not exist up until Saxo's time. But even though his goal is just history, we keep in mind that history is kind of always a narrative. It is always attributing large forces to individual people even though those individual people may not have had quite as much agency as the story tends to give to them. As Michael Shudson put it, uh, to pass a version of the past on, it has to be encapsulated into some sort of cultural form, uh, and into a narrative with a beginning, a middle, and end, an original state of equilibrium, a disruption, a resolution, it has to have a protagonist overcoming obstacles, and, and that sort of thing. The historian Hayden White also has written a lot about the narrativization of, of history or the implotment of history. And as a narrative, a chronicle or any other uh, account is susceptible to uh, change over time. There is, uh, the author has to select through all these different potential elements of this multiform of all these different story elements and events and ultimately decide what's important, what do I include, how do I describe it, what else do I need to add, what sort of interpretations and explanations do I need to add, uh, and create a, a specific iteration of a multiform story that could have gone many other different ways, and frequently one that will be contested by other people with other points of view. Each successive iteration, even if it's based on the one before it, tends to add many things that the new author thinks he read or thinks he saw in the original text, which may or may not have actually been there. Each iteration undergoes many successive changes before it at length arrives at a relatively fixed form in which it may become current throughout a whole community. Uh, it seems that Saxo wanted to be that final form. He wanted to take this oral tradition, these other competing accounts, and put them into the definitive version. But of course, when the definitive version of history comes at a later stage, it's further removed from the actual events themselves. So we always want to be a little bit skeptical. To create that definitive form, Saxo is redacting lots of different sources. Some of those sources he's taking directly from oral tradition. Some of those sources he's taking from other written texts. And, of course, a redactor has to reconcile uh, discrepancies between parallel accounts. If you've got two different accounts of the same story, which one do you go with? Do you try to combine them both or uh, change one? And, and also, the redactor has his or her own influences. In this case, Saxo is clearly familiar with Virgil's Aeneid, which we've already read in this class. There's a passage which you'll read about Amleth where he tries to inscribe or create pictures of his deeds, uh, all the things he's accomplished in his life, and have them all recorded on a shield. Well, this comes directly out of Virgil's Aeneid. It's a part that we didn't read. Uh, it's in the second half of, uh, of the Aeneid. But it's pretty clear that Saxo is introducing this element from Virgil's Aeneid rather than from some local uh, Scandinavian or Norse account about uh, Amleth. So every story has to be fit into a narrative frame, into a, a narrative context. And in this case, uh, everyone who's literate in the Middle Ages is going to know Latin and they're going to have read Virgil's Aeneid. So there's a little bit of that influence that will color the, the local traditions that get recorded in a chronicle like uh, Saxo's History of the Danes. And another thing a redactor is going to do in any narrative is going to do, any narrator is going to do, is to add interpretations about what people were thinking, because this is not something that 
pure history could really observe. You can observe what people say and what they write, but as far as what they were thinking, uh, you have to sort of create your own interpretation, what their motivations are, what they were afraid of, what they wanted, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And in narrative, we call this the sort of clunky title, unfortunately, but we call this free indirect discourse. This is when a narrator tells you what a character was thinking or what a character said, but doesn't give you a direct quotation. Uh, we're not left to infer what a character is thinking. We're not left to use theory of mind. We're told, here's what he was thinking, or here's the kind of thing he said. And a lot of this introduces interpretations from the narrator or the author. The author is telling us how we should interpret an event, not just leaving it to us to come up with our own interpretations. When Saxo says, oh, valiant Amleth uh, and worthy of immortal fame, who being shrewdly armed with a feint of folly, covered a wisdom too high for human wit under the marvelous disguise of silliness, and not only found in his subtlety means to protect his own safety, but also by its guidance found opportunity to avenge his father. Now, Saxo tells us this entire story detail by detail, but in this situation, in this uh, quotation, he's actually interpreting, summarizing, but then telling us that this is a great thing. This isn't just a, a deceptive person. This is someone who actually is worthy of praise. But remember the difference between the way Homer described the trickery of Odysseus and the way that Virgil described the trickery of the Greeks. Uh, Homer thought this was great. Uh, Virgil thought this was uh, wickedness, thought this was uh, uh, underhanded and uh, uh, not a virtue. Uh, well, we see with Saxo in praising Amleth, he's trying to say that this sort of trickery is a good thing. So this is the narrator uh, sort of sliding his interpretation in alongside the facts. And that sort of thing we call free and direct discourse. Now, elsewhere in Saxo's text, uh, the Justa Danorum, the History of the Danes, uh, he doesn't just tell the story of Amleth. He tells the story of Amleth in the end of book three and the beginning of book four. Uh, he also describes a lot of other characters which we may be familiar with today. For instance, if you watch the History Channel show Vikings about Ragnar Lodbrok and his sons, Saxo is one of the main sources for what we know about Ragnar and his sons, and including his first wife, Lagertha. The figures of Bjorn Ironsides and Ivar the Boneless and Uba Fitzirk and Sigurd Snake Eye, uh, these characters that we see on the TV show and elsewhere that also figure in certain uh, Norse sagas do have their basis uh, in something that happened in history. Now, can we say that Saxo's version is the true definitive historical account, uh, whereas the, the sagas are more fictionalized? Well, no, we really can't, because for all we know, Saxo's sources for these were the sagas or were oral versions of the sagas at this time. And in Saxo's account in Book 9, where he introduces Ragnar Lodbrok and uh, his sons, he, he also introduces Lagertha, who's one of several female warriors that Saxo mentions. She's someone who actually does don armor, pick up a shield, pick up a sword, and go with her own army to uh, fight against other armies. And she comes to Ragnar's rescue uh, a time or two, despite the fact that uh, Ragnar uh, leaves her at one point. She still uh, shows up and, and saves his life in Book 9 of uh, Saxo's history. And in the narrative about Amleth, we also read about two other female characters that were that were very dominant and proactive. Uh, one of those is Sela. She's the sister of Cole, king of Norway. And she's described as, quote, Saxo tells us, quote, a skilled warrior experienced in roving. And in your translation, whenever you read roving, this is, you know, raiding. This is uh, doing what Vikings do, getting in a ship and going and attacking and plundering. Uh, a foreign settlement. But this is something women did as well as men. And then, of course, there's the character of Hermanthrude, who's the second wife of Amleth and the Queen of Scotland, who Saxo describes as being a queen, but for all practical purposes, being a king or being a, a queen with the quality of a king. In other words, she was just as assertive and just as respected and just as powerful uh, as a queen as any uh, male king would have been. Saxo also describes another familiar character. If you've already read the saga of Rolf Kraki, uh, Rolf shows up again in uh, Saxo's history, as well as references to Lidar, the capital, which is uh, uh, Rolf Kraki's capital, but also Hrothgar's capital in Beowulf. And Saxo relates several stories about the Norse gods with one sort of condition, and that is uh, he employs what's called euhemerism. This comes from the name of a, a Greek historian who uh, suggested that the gods were really just uh, historical humans that over time, as their legend was told, the narratives added these supernatural qualities to them. And so the gods are actually once human, 
but people just sort of exaggerated their actual powers to sort of grant them supernatural powers only in the story. That's humorism. And Saxo wants to tell stories about Odin and Balder and, and other Norse gods, but wants to remind us, you know, as he is a, a Christian chronicler, this is long after the conversion of Denmark to Christianity, uh, he wants to tell these stories, but he wants to sort of distance himself from any other religion. And so he'll tell stories about Odin. He'll say at that time there was a man called Odin who was believed throughout Europe, though falsely, to be a god. In other words, yeah, I'm going to tell the story about Odin, but he wasn't a god. He was a human. Uh, maybe that he had magical powers or something like that, but he still wasn't a god. He wasn't competition for the Christian god. Now, for the character of Amleth, we know this wasn't a character that Saxo invented because there in, in Old Icelandic, there are references to uh, a character named Amlothi, which is uh, cognate with Amleth, which meant fool. It came, this name comes to be later used in Old Norse just to mean a fool. And there's a reference in the Prose Edda by the Icelandic uh, poet and author Snorri Sturluson that uh, Snorri is trying to describe some of the poetical references to past mythology that people have sort of forgotten the stories about. Uh, he's trying to sort of remind people who may have forgotten the stories that these poetic references refer to. Uh, he's trying to explain these stories a little bit, and he says there was a poet named Snyborn uh, who relates this line. Uh, they say the nine sea brides turn fast the most hostile island mill out beyond the land's edge, they who long ago ground Amlothi's flower. Now, this reference to Amlothi's flower is a description of sand, uh, sand that's on the, the seashore. And the island mill, the, the mill that sort of grinds up islands the way a, a human mill would ground up uh, grain and make it into flour, uh, well, the ocean is like a mill. It, metaphorically, the ocean is the mill of islands, grounds up these islands into flour, and the flour is the sand on the beach. And this connection of this character named Amlothi with this reference to sand as flour is something we see in Amleth. Uh, and that lets us know that this is something that has been part of Amleth's story since very early on. He's someone who describes uh, the, the real world in metaphorical language, in poetic language. And this, in Anglo-Saxon literature, is called a kenning. I'm going to go ahead and introduce this term, even though it's specifically about Anglo-Saxon literature like Beowulf, but it's the kind of thing we see in all Germanic literature, especially northern Germanic literature. That is, it's a metaphoric or metonymic figure of speech that refers to an object indirectly, usually in the form of a compound word, like Amlothi's flower is a kenning for sand, or the island mill is a kenning for sea. In other words, Amleth or Amlothi is this characterization of poetry as something mistaken for foolishness, uh, referring to reality in, a, in an oblique way, in an indirect way, an artistic way, in a way that a lot of people will just think is ridiculous or doesn't make any sense, but actually does make sense if you can connect the vehicle with the tenor. There are also other accounts of Amleth or Amlothi that come after Saxo Grammaticus's time, but show the signs that they were also gathered from folk tales rather than being uh, influenced directly by Saxo. Uh, one of these is the Icelandic Ambelis saga, which wasn't actually written down until the 17th century, until roughly contemporary with Shakespeare's uh, Hamlet. But it's written down in Iceland, and it seems to be uh, derived from a lot of folk tales. And these folk tales have just enough uh, ties, uh, just enough parallels with Saxo's Amleth and some of these other references that let us know this is part of a continuous character, a continuous uh, story that shows up in different narratives across Northern Europe. Uh, it, this is also a more complete account. It's a whole saga. Uh, and if you're interested in that, I'll put a link to that in the uh, YouTube uh, description. And I'll mention briefly that there are parallels outside of Scandinavia with the Amleth story. Uh, primarily the figure of Lucius Junius Brutus, who was one of the founders of the Roman Republic back in 509 BCE. He killed his uncle, the last Roman tyrant, uh, Lucius Tarquinius uh, Priscus. Uh, and one of the ways he was able to plot against this really powerful tyrant, his uncle, was to pretend to be foolish, to pretend to be stupid. Uh, and that's what the name Brutus means, means, you know, Lucius Junius, the, the stupid. But he was just pretending. He was just pretending so that he could escape being caught before he was a actually able to kill this, this tyrant. And by killing this tyrant, he then, you know, he and his other co-founders of the uh, Roman Republic were able to free up the Republic itself to be to be something that was actually sort of ruled by the Senate rather than by a single individual.
Now, to what extent was the earlier uh, story of Amlothi or Amleth influenced by this uh, Roman Brutus? Uh, we don't know. But we can be pretty certain that Saxo at least knew of uh, the Roman Brutus story uh, because he was fluent in Latin and uh, would have been educated with uh, Latin history. Still, it's highly unlikely that he could have just made up the Amleth story from this, uh, not to mention the fact that there are these other references to this poetical uh, character who's mistaken for a fool. So in Saxo's character of Amleth, we have this uh, coalescing of uh, a character who is a, a poet who can uh, use metaphor and indirect references to describe reality in a way that other people just think is foolish. Uh, it's someone who is able to then use this, uh, the fact that other people underestimate him to uh, right a wrong, that is the murder of his father by his uncle. And it's this character that will eventually show up as Shakespeare's Hamlet, although, as we're going to see, there are some clear and obvious differences. But he says of his, uh, the character of Amleth says of his uh, strategy, that it is better to choose the garb of dullness, that is of foolishness or stupidity, than of sense, and to borrow some protection from a slow, from a show of utter frenzy. Yet the passion to avenge my father still burns in my heart, but I'm watching the chances, I await the fitting hour. There is a place for all things. Against so merciless and dark a spirit must be used the deeper devices of the mind. And that's uh, the theme of the character. It's, there's all, he, it doesn't seem like there's much going on in his head, but there really is. There's a lot more than any of these other characters realize. But although he was pulling off this deception, he didn't want to be known as a liar. As Saxo tells us, uh, he was loath to be thought prone to lying about any matter. In other words, he didn't want to be known as someone who could lie or wanted to lie. And accordingly, he mingled craft and candor, that is, uh, guile or trickiness, as well as secrecy, in such a way that though his words did not lack truth, yet there was nothing to betoken the truth and betray how far his keenness went. Uh, in other words, he wasn't lying, but the words weren't so obvious that they would give away how intelligent he was and that he was up to something and that he was planning revenge. And so this is uh, a kind of irony. And that word irony has lots of different meanings. You probably learned several in your high school English classes uh, that there was situational irony where uh, the audience knew something that the character didn't, you know, dramatic irony or tragic irony. Uh, there's also structural irony where maybe the narrator doesn't know something that the audience really uh, understands uh, or something about the structure is sort of set up to be uh, so that the words mean something other than what we actually read. But what uh, Amleth is using here is verbal irony. Uh, we can define that as speech that has a meaning other than the obvious meaning. But irony is not just lying. Verbal irony takes us back closest to the original Greek sense of irony. And the word irony comes from uh, originally this uh, word eroneia, which means dissembling. Not exactly lying, but doing something that people will draw an idea from that's, that's not very accurate. And there was a character called the Iron uh, in a lot of Greek comedy especially that was a very intelligent character, but a, a character that was in a weaker position than a stronger character, which was called the Alazon. But the Iron was able to misrepresent himself, even though in a position of weakness, until uh, he was able to overcome the stronger opponent, who was a bit slow-witted, uh, or who just didn't have to think very much. A character who's strong, who has power over others, doesn't have to be that intelligent to get his own way most of the time. But a character who's weak, or in a weaker position, has to think ahead and, and has to be, uh, has to come in under the radar, not be recognized as a threat until he's able to, uh, take power for himself. And Hamlet is very much this type of character. He's in a weaker position and he's much more intelligent than the person in, in power, but he can't show that. He has to come across as a bit slow witted. And I want to digress for just a second to talk about another element of irony. Uh, you may have heard the, the joke about a panda. So in this joke, a fellow is sitting in a truck stop cafe in California having lunch when suddenly a giant panda walks in and orders a burger with fries and a chocolate milkshake. The, uh, the panda sits down, eats the food, then stands up, shoots several of the other customers, and runs out the door. The guy's astonished, but the waiter seems completely undisturbed. What the hell is going on, the customer asks. Oh, well, there's nothing surprising about that, says the waiter. Just look it up in the dictionary under panda. 
So the guy goes to the library, takes out a dictionary, and looks up panda, a big furry black and white animal that lives in the rainforest of China. It eats, shoots, and leaves. This joke is used by the neuroscientist Vilno Ramachandran to illustrate something that happens in humor. Uh, the structure of a joke is actually kind of predictable, even though there's you know uh, thousands and thousands of different specific jokes. They tend to follow this sort of structure. The speaker shares certain information, selected information, that leads a listener to a particular expectation. That is a, a narration. Uh, in, a, in a narration, you pick certain details to uh, share with the, the listener. And then there's an unexpected twist that prompts a reinterpretation of all of that preceding information. And Ramachandran says it's critical that the new interpretation after this uh, unexpected twist, uh, though it's wholly unexpected, has to make as much sense of the entire set of facts as did the original expected interpretation. The joke is funny only if the listener gets the punchline by seeing in a flash of insight how a completely new interpretation of the same set of facts can incorporate the anomalous ending. In the joke about the panda, the panda walks into a restaurant and, and acts like a human, just like uh, in any other joke where animals can act like humans. And a horse walks into a bar and the bartender says, why the long face, and that kind of thing. But once we hear that this is all uh, an acting out of a dictionary definition, minus a comma, uh, that a panda eats shoots and leaves, in other words, it eats bamboo shoots and bamboo leaves, or the panda eats something and then shoots people and then walks away. That reference to the dictionary definition of the eat, shoots, and leaves makes us go back and reinterpret what we just heard about the panda going into the restaurant and shooting people. Without it, we would still have a story about a panda who, you know, acted like a human, but it wouldn't have the, the new interpretation. So there's two separate interpretations of the same facts. That joke depends on verbal irony. Uh, the same words meaning two different things or having two different interpretations. This is something that is Amleth's main characteristic. Uh, that early, early reference to Amlothi's mill or Amlothi's flower. Uh, this character was known as someone who made a reference to the sand as if it was flour ground up in the mill of the sea. And something similar in Saxo's account of Amleth, uh, where he's taken along the beach and his companions see the rudder of a ship which had been wrecked, and he says this was the right knife to carve such a huge ham. In that, he means the rudder of a ship is carving the sea. The sea is a ham that's being carved up by this rudder because the rudder cuts into the water. And then again, they pass the sand dunes on the beach and tell him to look at the, the meal, meaning the sand. And he replied that it had been ground small by the uh, tempest of the ocean. And his companions praised his answer. And he said that, you know, I meant what I said. I'm, I'm speaking the truth. So what he's doing there is interpreting something metaphorically. Uh, remember that a metaphor is uh, fusing two schemas, uh, two different uh, imagery from two different uh, references that enable one thing to be spoken of as if it had the properties of a different thing. The same information, the same visual information, in this case, either the sea or the sand, uh, has two different schemas that can describe it, two different interpretations. It fits the criteria of metaphor. It also fits the criteria of verbal irony. So this double reference sort of fits two different types of uh, figurative language. But it also requires us to engage in theory of mind to a level that we normally don't have to, and to a level that uh, Fing's uh, retainers that are sort of keeping watch over Amleth uh, aren't very well able to do. Remember that theory of mind is the uh, ability to impute mental states to yourself and to others to predict their behavior on the basis of these states, uh, to be able to understand what another individual is thinking, what their beliefs are, whether those beliefs are accurate or inaccurate, uh, what they want, what they're afraid of, and that sort of thing. And uh, literature really pushes us to use theory of mind more than we normally would. The situations presented in literary fiction, because they disrupt our expectations, because they defamiliarize us, uh, they require us to draw on more flexible and interpretive resources to infer the feelings and thoughts of the characters. We have to use theory of mind more in fiction, uh, usually, than we do in reality. So think of us as compared to Amleth's companions. They hear him say one thing, and they just assume he means exactly what he says. We realize that what he says uh, is not alone what he thinks, that it is a, an oblique reference, an indirect reference, a metaphor, or verbal irony, that he's actually thinking something slightly different than the most obvious interpretation of what he says. And this game of theory of mind is something that Saxo, as an author, as a narrator, kind of sells us short on, uh, precisely because he uses so much free and direct discourse. When he tells us uh, Amos said this, but he was really thinking this, he kind of undermines the joke. It's kind of like somebody that tells a joke but gives away the punchline too soon. 
And this is something that's going to be really relevant when we compare Amleth in Saxo to Hamlet in Shakespeare. Uh, how much work we as a reader or as an audience have to do. Uh, we actually don't have to do that much work in Saxo because he will tell us, notice the double meanings of what Amleth just said, where Shakespeare won't do that. There is no narrator in a play, uh, or at least in, in Shakespeare's play, Hamlet. So we have to uh, not fall for the, the simple interpretation, the, the easy, the, the obvious interpretation. Okay, let's take a quick look at our characters here. Just always, uh, in your notebook, always keep a character list as you're reading a text like this. It's easy to get confused about who's actually king in Denmark at this point, uh, because we have a reference to Rorik, the high king, uh, at Lara. But remember that Lara is on the island of Zealand, and that's the sort of really central, powerful capital, where uh, the, the main king there will have sort of subordinate kings in, in other territories. And... Some of those subordinate kings are Horwindel or Orvindel, and depending on your translation, it may be Orvindel or Horwindel. Uh, and this is a character that shows up a lot in, in Old Norse literature. Uh, but he has a brother named Fing, and they're both given sort of governorship over Jutland, the peninsula. Uh, so they're still subject to Rorik, the king of Denmark, but they each have their own territory that they rule over. And Orvindel or Horwindel is a sort of heroic character, and he uh, goes off to fight uh, Cole, the king of Norway. They have a duel, and in that duel they agree to uh, pay each other war guild. You know, whoever kills the other will then pay his survivors a certain amount of money. That's going to become very important later. But despite his successes uh, raiding and uh, the successes in battle, uh, Horwindel is eventually murdered by his brother Fing, uh, and Horwindel's wife, Garuda, uh, then marries Fing. And, uh, but before this happens, they've already given birth to Amleth. So Amleth is the son of Horwindel and Garuda. Uh, he's the nephew of Fang. Uh, he has an unnamed foster brother that's going to help him out when other people are trying to trap him. Uh, one of the ways people try to trap him is they set him up with this girl and they see if he wants to sleep with her. Uh, she's not given a, a name either. We're just going to refer to her as Amleth's lover. Uh, but they were childhood friends. That becomes important because that's why she doesn't betray him. Uh, there is a friend of Fang who's unnamed, but he goes to try to spy on Amleth while Amleth is talking to his mother, Garuda. There's the king of Britain. Uh, there are two retainers or two thanes or two henchmen of Fang that are sent with Amleth to the king of Britain. Uh, there's the daughter of the king of Britain who Amleth marries. Uh, there's Hermantrude or uh, Hermantruda who uh, is Amleth's second wife despite the fact that he remains married to the, the princess of Britain. And then eventually there's the son of Rorik named Viglek who is the one who eventually kills Amleth. So when we keep track of who these characters are, we want to keep in mind, use theory of mind, think about what each of their motives are. What do they want? What do they think about Hamlet? Uh, and more importantly, how do they interpret the things that Amleth says? So in several of these uh, descriptions where Amleth will uh, say something to usually Fing's retainers, uh, Fing's henchmen, the ones that are keeping an eye on him to make sure that he's not plotting revenge for the murder of his father, uh, they're looking to make sure he's really insane and not just pretending. Uh, but at the same time, he wants to say something that's true from a certain point of view with, under a certain interpretation. Uh, so there's a, a real game for the narrative to work. We have to see these other characters misinterpreting his words. But that means that we have to keep track of two interpretations of each of these descriptions, each of these metaphorical descriptions or verbal irony or, uh, or understatements. Uh, we've got to keep track of what Amos' actual meaning is, but then keep that distinct from what Fing's men think he means by those words. And not all of these references are metaphor or verbal irony. Take, for example, these wooden stakes that he's been carving. He's been sort of creating these barbed uh, stakes, almost like tent stakes, from the, the very beginning, from the, the earliest time when he was you know, making himself all dirty and trying to look really uh, incompetent. Uh, he spends all of his time creating these stakes, and when Fing's men ask him why he's doing that, he actually says something that's pretty close to the truth. He says, I'm preparing javelins to avenge my father. Now, they think this is ridiculous because uh, these little sticks, they're, they're very small, and they're not something that you can use as a javelin. You can't throw these things and, and kill somebody with them. Uh, and if you're looking for weapons, there's you know a lot better weapons just lying around. And so they think, well, even if he is plotting revenge, which he just said he is, he says, I'm planning to avenge my father, uh, they're looking at this and thinking, okay, even if he wants to, he's too incompetent with weapons. He doesn't understand what these things are. They're just wooden sticks. He can't do anything with them. He can't use them as javelins. Therefore, he's not a threat. 
But what we see is from very early on, he has an idea about what he's going to use these for. But he doesn't actually see them as javelins. He's clearly not going to use them as direct weapons to stab or, or you know, throw at somebody. But that doesn't mean they, ha they don't have a purpose. Uh, so they're going to show up later. He knows exactly what he's going to use them for. But the way he describes them leads the others to assume that he has no idea what he's doing. Still, people are a little bit suspicious of him. And Fing knows he can't just uh, directly kill Amleth because he's married to Amleth's mother. And that's going to be a problem. But also, he doesn't want to offend his high king, Rorik, by uh, uh, killing the son of the, uh, uh, his, Rorik's former champion, Horvindel. So Fing sends him to the King of Britain. Now it's important at this point to know a little bit about British history, which is also going to be important in Beowulf, uh, which I also mentioned in uh, a previous lecture about the you know, history of medieval uh, Europe at this point. But from the time that the Romans withdrew from Britain, Anglo Saxons and Jutes started to invade Britain. And so there were, uh, the Anglo Saxon kingdoms were actually coming from the area of the Jutland Peninsula. You see on the map here that uh, the Saxons are coming from just south of uh, the Jutland Peninsula. The Angles, the, the, the homeland of Angeln, is the central part of the Jutland Peninsula. And then the Jutes are coming from the, the northern part of the Jutland Peninsula. And this is where uh, Amleth and Fing uh, are, are coming from. They're coming from the area marked as Jutes up here. Not only that, but centuries after the Angles and Saxons had sort of uh, become the dominant power in England, when Britain had become Engleland, England, we have uh, later uh, invasions of the uh, Norse people from all over Norway and, and Denmark and that area. They're sometimes referred to as the Danes and sometimes referred to as Norse. Uh, they were, remember in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, referred to as the Great Heathen Army that invades uh, sort of northern central England and establishes what later becomes known as the Dane Law. Uh, they, they win so many victories here that uh, Alfred the Great and some of the other uh, kings of uh, Wessex and Mercia uh, decide, okay, just let them stay there and we'll pay them not to you know, further attack us. And this great heathen army, once again, to, to go back to the reference to the, the, the History Channel show uh, Vikings and to you know, uh, the figures of Ragnar Lodbrok, Bjorn Ironsides, Ivar the Boneless, Uba, uh, these are the guys that are leading the Great Heathen Army historically. So does that mean that Fing is sending Amleth to Ragnar Lodbrok or Ivar or somebody like that? Well, no. Uh, we don't know uh, that Saxo really knows any specific king that uh, he may have in mind at this point. But it's important that we think of England as not disconnected from the Norse world. For much of its history, especially in the early Middle Ages, England was, for all practical purposes, a Scandinavian kingdom, right up until the Norman Conquest. In the early part of the, you know, a few decades before the Norman Conquest, a king named Knut, or Knut the Great, was king of Denmark, but he also ruled over Norway and England as the, the primary king. We don't want to think of England as being too distinct from the, the area that Saxo is, is writing about. And when Fang sends Amleth and his two retainers to the king of Britain, he also sends with him this uh, stick, and a lot of really important sticks in this uh, story. But rather than just tell his two henchmen, uh, deliver this message to the, the king of Britain, uh, he sends uh, a secret message. And the way he does this is by carving runes on a stick. And the word rune actually means secret. So if you want to keep something secret, uh, you carve it in these letters that almost nobody can read, but uh, Fang can read it and carve it, and he knows the king of Britain can do the same thing. And in Saxo, in Saxo's time, uh, runes aren't used very much anymore, but he still remembers what they are, but he, he takes it upon himself to describe to his reader what exactly this is. He says that uh, two of Fing's uh, retainers set out with Amleth bearing a letter engraved on wood. And at one time, this was a familiar kind of writing material. And we know from archaeological finds like this one that uh, these sorts of messages were frequently carved on wood. In fact, the runes, the reason they're so uh, sort of stick-like rather than having more curves is uh, because they were designed to be able to be carved on wood uh, before ink and parchment were widely available. What Fing didn't count on, though, was that Amleth could also read runes, and he could carve these runes. And while they're on the ship headed for Britain, Amleth finds this uh, rune staff and then uh, scrapes off all the, the runes that are on there, carves on his own runes, and says, uh, kill these two retainers, and meanwhile, give Amleth in marriage to your daughter. And the king of Britain does this. Well, you know, clearly there's this bond. There's uh, the king of Britain and Fing actually have history together, and they're 
close friends. So this is something that Fing thought he could get the King of Britain to do uh, without facing the consequences of killing his own nephew and stepson. Now, once again, Amleth is playing with interpretations. He actually carved those runes that said, kill these two retainers, but he wants to keep up the pretense that it was actually a thing that did that. So he acts as if he has been wounded uh, personally, that these were his men, and now that they've been killed, the King of Britain has to pay war guild. Now, war guild is a, an old English term that just literally means man gold. In the Germanic world, in the Old Norse world, in the Old English world, uh, there were constant blood feuds. One person would insult another, and that second person would kill the first person. Well, killing somebody just then means that their next of kin or their closest friends then are going to get revenge on you. And then, you know, if they kill you, then your friends are going to get revenge on them. It's just going to go back and forth. So one of the ways that the uh, Anglo-Saxons and, and Norse came up with to keep this sort of, you know, blood feud from going on forever was the, the principle of giving gold to the survivors of somebody after you kill them. And it doesn't matter why you kill them, even if they really deserved it or whatever. But there, there is this custom of give, paying gold in order to replace the men that you, you killed. And you have a description of this all the way back at the beginning of this uh, Amleth episode, before uh, uh, Amleth is born, his father Horvindel uh, goes to war with King Cole of Norway. And they describe to each other before they fight this duel, uh, they agree that uh, whoever is the, the victor and kills the other one will then pay a certain amount of war guild to uh, the, the deceased's uh, survivors. And they say that, you know, this is a, a good practice. This is something that good people do. Uh, you know, the man who pays the rightful dues over his dead enemy wins the goodwill of the survivor. Well, I don't know about that. And frequently we have, uh, in, in old Icelandic family sagas where this is ongoing feud, we have someone refuse to accept war guilt. Uh, but the thing is, if you accept war guilt, if somebody kills a friend of yours or a family member and you take gold from them, you give up your right to then go get revenge. Uh, the, the gold is supposed to sort of buy away the revenge. And Amleth demands this, but he doesn't make it obvious. He melts this gold down and puts them into these hollowed out sticks. And he does this so that later, when people ask him, uh, what happened to your two friends? You know, they don't know that the King of Britain has killed these two guys, uh, much less why, much less that the, the runes were changed to, uh, to fool the King of Britain into to killing them. Uh, but this gives Amleth the opportunity to say something else crazy, which is to hold up these two sticks and go, here are these two friends, here are my two friends. Well, it, it was a custom frequently to, uh, if someone was going to refuse war guild, they would say, I, I refuse to carry my brother around in my purse. In other words, my brother has been replaced by the gold I've been giving his war guild by the person who killed him, uh, but I'm not going to carry him around his gold. I'm going to refuse that, and I'm going to get blood vengeance for the, the murder of my brother. So by referring to the sticks as if they were the two retainers, uh, there is a, a certain truth to that in the way people talk. Because um, these, this is the word guild. Inside these sticks is the word guild for those two retainers. So again, Amleth isn't actually lying. He's speaking figuratively, but Fing's men take it literally. And taking it literally makes it sound completely ridiculous that, you know, this guy's two friends are these two sticks. And when he returns from Britain to Jutland, to, to Denmark, uh, he has asked his mother to uh, put on a, a funeral for him to pretend as if he was dead, which, again, is something that Fing expects. Uh, he does not expect uh, Amleth to show up again. Uh, so they're having a funeral for something that is totally plausible. Uh, Fing believes it's appropriate that, yes, I, I do believe there's a chance that he was killed in Britain. Uh, what he's not telling Garuda is that he actually ordered that, that death. But uh, uh, Amleth has also asked Garuda to uh, hang up all these tapestries in the hall. So that we have all of these these woven tapestries that were used as decoration, especially in the later Middle Ages in stone halls, uh, because the stones would stay cold. You put the tapestries up as sort of insulation. But Amleth has a, another intention for them. Uh, they go along with those quote-unquote javelins that he's been carving, these little sticks, these barbed sticks he's been carving all this time that people thought was a sign of his insanity. Uh, he's then going to use these after he gets all of Fing's men drunk uh, while they're uh, asleep or they're so drunk that they don't know what's going on. He drops all these tapestries on them, and then he runs these uh, stakes through them so that they're all sort of pinned in place, and they, they can't get free. They don't know what's happening outside of, of this sort of uh, collapsed tapestry tent that they're trapped under. And that's when Amleth sets the hall on fire. 
you know, he's not going to be able to kill all these guys individually. You know, even if they're drunk, he'd probably still uh, would only be able to kill a few before the rest realized what was going on enough to defend themselves. But they're drunk and trapped under these tapestries, uh, and the building is, is burning down around them. They have no, no idea what's going on until it's too late. Uh, also, because he pretended to sort of accidentally stab himself, uh, uh, people took Amleth's sword away and they replaced it with one that uh, the sword was sort of uh, attached to the, the sheath so that he couldn't get it out. Well, he switches his sword with uh, Fingy's sword. And when Fing wakes up and Amleth tells him, now I'm here to get revenge for my father, he tries to pull the sword out of the sheath and he's you know, still groggy and he can't get the sword out. So Amleth uh, technically is fighting somebody who is armed. Uh, you know, Fing actually does have a sword. It's just he can't get the sword out of the sheath. Uh, so Amleth is able to kill him and still call it a duel uh, and, rather than necessarily cold-blooded murder. And he's able to do something that if we come from the expectation of uh, this version mirroring Shakespeare's Hamlet, uh, we probably didn't expect. We did not ex may not have expected uh, that Amleth wins. Amleth actually does get revenge for his father. He kills Fing. He doesn't die uh, in, in the process. He's not indecisive. All of this acting crazy uh, or acting foolish uh, is all a cover. Everything he does is sort of getting him closer to this actual revenge. So Amleth's vengeance is accomplished. He's still alive to enjoy the uh, fruits of his labor. And there's a whole second half to his story. He returns to Britain where, remember, he's married the daughter of the king of Britain. But that brings him into the middle of a new conflict. Uh, that is that now the King of Britain is in a similar position to the one Amleth had been in previously. Uh, the King of Britain, we learn, had actually uh, had a, a pact with Fing uh, that if one of them was killed, the other would be his avenger. So these were these were close uh, friends, Fing and the King of Britain. And uh, they had uh, set it up so that uh, one would avenge the other. And now the King of Britain realizes that his son-in-law is the one that he's going to have to kill because in order to uh, keep his vow to Fing. Uh, so, you know, this is very similar. By the, the divided loyalty is very similar to the one that Amleth had been in previously when he had to uh, uh, kill his uncle to avenge his father. It's also similar to the uh, bind that Fing had been in when he needed to kill his nephew, uh, Amleth, uh, but he didn't want to do that because it's his nephew, and, you know, he would incur the wrath of both his wife and uh, the High King, uh, Rorik. So, like Fing, uh, the King of Britain thinks, I'll send Hamleth away to uh, someone who, someone else who will kill him, and that is the Queen of Scotland who kills all of her suitors. Well, uh, Amleth agrees to go uh, woo the Queen of Scotland on the King of Britain's behalf, but lo and behold, despite the fact that she's killed all her previous suitors, she actually thinks Amleth is, is the kind of guy she wants to, to marry. Uh, now remember, Amleth is still married to the princess of Britain, uh, the daughter of the king of Britain, uh, and you know, he's able to marry Hermintruda uh, without uh, divorcing his first wife or anything like that. Uh, and so he comes back again to Britain, but he knows at this point that the king of Britain is probably setting him up, so uh, he brings a, a, an army of Scots along with him, and even though he, his men are outnumbered at a certain point, he uh, you know, props up the, the bodies of the, his own dead soldiers so that from a distance it looks like he still has a, a huge army, uh, and that eventually allows him to kill the King of Britain. Uh, so once again, uh, using uh, deceptiveness that's not a direct lie, uh, using a, a type of irony, uh, Amleth is able to uh, accomplish what he needs to accomplish and, and survive the, the ordeal. It's only then, eventually, when uh, Viglek, the uh, son of Rorik, becomes the High King of Denmark, uh, again, uh, Amleth sort of over-king, uh, that he begins making trouble for Garuda back in Denmark, and then Amleth comes back, and uh, he's eventually killed in battle with Viglek. So, despite the very different ending, there's enough with the characters and with the individual parts of the Amleth versus Fing plot that we can recognize enough parallels to tie uh, Saxo Grammaticus's story of Amleth with uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. And this is something I'll come back to when we talk about Shakespeare's Hamlet later in the semester. But we have a sort of ambiguous background characters like the uh, King Rorik uh, in, in Amleth and uh, the King of Norway, who's just described as Old Norway in Shakespeare. Uh, his son Fortinbras, who's the one who rides in at the end and uh, sort of 
after Hamlet and every, everyone is dead, uh, takes over, has you know some vague similarities to Viglek. But the rest of the characters are actually pretty close, uh, pretty easily recognizable, even a lot of the ones who aren't named. So Orvindel is old Hamlet, you know, Hamlet's father in Shakespeare is just called old Hamlet. Uh, Fing is Claudius. Uh, Fing and Claudius, the names may not be very close, but we recognize them, whereas Garuda is clearly uh, very similar, even in name form, to Gertrude. Amleth is Hamlet. Uh, his unnamed foster brother, the one that helps him out of the situation where he was supposed to, uh, where Fing's men were going to test him to see if he would sleep with this young woman. Uh, his foster brother sends this little uh, insect with a straw tied to it so that he'll know something's up when it flies past him. Uh, that foster brother seems to be um, his sort of partner in crime. It seems pretty close to Horatio, although Horatio is a much more developed character in Shakespeare. Uh, there's also the the woman that uh, he goes to sleep with who actually, you know, helps him, uh, actually sleeps with him, but then helps him keep it a secret because they were uh, lifelong friends. Uh, this is something we know from some of the hints that uh, we hear from the speech between Hamlet and Ophelia, that they've known each other for a long time. The implication there is that they had been lovers. There's the friend of Fing, who's unnamed, but he's the one who spies on uh, Amleth while Amleth was talking to Garuda. He's in the straw, and uh, Amleth stabs through the straw to kill him, just like uh, Hamlet stabs through the curtain while Polonius is uh, spying on him, uh, speaking to his mother Gertrude. Uh, the King of Britain is used for the same purpose. Uh, these two retainers in Shakespeare, it's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, are uh, sent along with uh, Hamlet to the King of Britain, where Claudius is hoping he won't make it back. Now, we don't know whether Hamlet actually set up Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to be killed by the King of Britain, but we hear the, the line, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead toward the end. So we have clearly recognizable characters, clearly recognizable uh, plot events, but don't overlook the difference. When you're comparing Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, to Saxo Grammaticus's narrative uh, from the uh, history of the Danes, notice the biggest difference is the way we know what's happening, the way we know what characters are thinking. Saxo has the free and direct discourse. He can just tell us, this is what Amleth was thinking, this is what the young woman that he uh, was with, uh, his lover, his childhood friend, this is what she was thinking, this is why she uh, helped him out, this is why his foster brother helped him out. Uh, all of this description of the internal state, of the thoughts of the characters, is something Saxo can just tell us directly. And it's something he does consistently try to explain to us, maybe explain too much, even though we kind of get, yes, we see the double meaning there. But Saxo insists on sort of giving away the uh, punchline of the joke before he's through telling the joke. He overexplains everything. But when we get to Shakespeare, we're going to have to infer from dialogue everything the characters think. And keeping in mind that especially Hamlet is going to be saying things that he doesn't mean. But even in Shakespeare, we're going to see some of this double meaning. We're going to see verbal irony. We're going to see metaphor. When the other characters don't recognize it, we, the audience, have to recognize it. And I think that's why this is such a good example of the same story, two different narrative forms, but the difference in those narrative forms really, really changes how we see what happens and how we interpret the characters and what they do throughout that narrative.